Uh, welcome to uh, today's interest session. And uh, we're going to cover today uh, creating and managing database um, databases using Microsoft SQL Server. So SQL Server uh, is a Microsoft product proprietary. Uh, it is uh, something in the in the family of DBMS database management systems. Um, the SQL Server itself is one proprietary version of that. Oracle is another. Um, MySQL is another. So you have these different database systems, DBMSs that have all kinds of different data management tools in them. Um, most, if not all of the uh, world's um, operational databases, even data mining and, and data warehousing systems are uh, relational database management systems, uh, RDBMS systems, and um, the two biggest, uh, Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle, but Microsoft has a business model that allows um, small and mid-sized and large businesses all to upgrade their licenses and if the performance um, uh, features along with those license upgrades allows them to really manage some pretty intense applications. So Microsoft SQL Server is the number one RDBMS system in use because it has so many different levels from small companies to large companies. So most of the time, any any organization that you're joining uh, will have a, a, a series of SQL databases that they use to operate, which makes it a very um, in-demand and very high need uh, skill set and knowledge base. Okay. Uh, and today's session, in case you're not aware of what interest is about, it's about introducing you to proprietary technologies and telling you how to get involved, how to download it, how to practice with it, how to use it, what it does, um, answer any questions for you, and kind of possibly give you one more track career-wise into something that you may not have known uh, was there. And that's the whole point of these interest um, sessions. So those of you who don't know about the eTIC, it's the Entrepreneurship and Technology Innovation Center. I'm the director, Dr. Nizik. I'm also your host and presenter for today. Uh, and we, what we do is um, uh, we are a prototyping center here at New York Tech uh, in room 107 in Harry Shore Hall and in uh, room 607 in New York City. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to stop down and join some of our programs, we have a certificate program that's available to you, uh, plus these interest sessions, plus our robotics project. So, uh, and of course we have a YouTube channel. Um, so I'll leave this up on screen for a few seconds and you can kind of take a snapshot of it or something uh, if you want. But these are our, our different uh, web pages and websites that um, allow you to kind of benefit from ETIC even if you're not physically coming here. Uh, so we'll get into the topic for today, uh, creating and managing databases using Microsoft SQL Server. Um, and you'll see uh, data is the new oil, right? And you've heard it, hopefully. <laughs> it's been around for a while, that term, but it really... Uh, it really is true. Uh, if if you're not familiar with why oil is the term we use here, um, historically, uh, when oil was first discovered, uh, it was a troublesome thing. It wasn't really. It was just this black gunk, you know, piling up from the from the earth and killing crops, and you know, really a negative thing. Um, and as soon as the uh, engine, you know, the the reciprocal engine was created, that that took oil and refined oil and oil was turned into kerosene for lamps and gasoline for cars. And it just was the, was the driver of the industrial revolution. So all this gunk, this garbage that was sitting out there uh, in these fields was turned into something extremely useful and became an unbelievably um, uh, powerful, uh, whoever controlled it really controlled the direction of the economy. Uh, and data is the new oil, right? So whoever has the most data, whoever utilizes that data properly, and to the best interest of their organization will control whatever domain that they're um, trying to operate in, right? So data is the new oil because um, those that use data the right way and the best way, the most efficient way for their organization uh, are going to have an edge over their competition, right? And what companies are looking for people and for you to do is to not just understand um, that data is the new oil, but understand how to use it properly, right? Uh, do we have, do, are we collecting the right information to make the decisions we need? If not, how do we collect more information? Um, how do we use the information we currently have to make decisions for the future? How do we um, increase our probability uh, of making correct decisions, right? That maybe we're at 50%, maybe we're at 20%, maybe we're making poor decisions, maybe we're making no better than chance decisions, 50-50, right? Um, how do we get that to 70, 80, 90% correct answers, 100% correct answers all the time using our data, right? That's what companies want to know from you. Uh, you have to be able to um, explain that and, and demonstrate that in some ways. And, and SQL Server is one of the ways that we demonstrate. Uh, all right, so for today, we'll talk about career opportunities, um, some database history to get you situated, um, you know, domain-wise, uh, knowledge-wise. 
Uh, we're going to go over Management Studio, which is a tool that you use to manage to, to control different SQL Server installations. Uh, talk about SQL, which is the standard language of database management systems, uh, search and query language. We we'll talked that um, talk about that in two different um, sections: DML, data manipulation language, and DDL, data definition language. Um, then we'll talk about SQL scripts, creating scripts that actually run autonomously, so that you can streamline your work and work faster and better, and more efficient. Um, we we'll talk about managing the databases, backing up and restoring them. We we'll talk about securing the databases, database security. Um, and we'll talk about something called SQL Server Agent, which is a tool that actually um, Microsoft gives you to control and automate all your different schedule processes that you want to run. Uh, it's really about becoming a one-person army, right? You know, they can hire a team of of uh, uh, data specialists to do what you can do as by yourself if you know how to talk the talk, meaning SQL, and you know how to automate it, creating scripts, and you know how to schedule those scripts to fire off at different times of the day to maintain your database um, through SQL Server Agent, you become, again, that one person army where you can uh, really be valuable, incredibly valuable to the organization. Uh, okay, so, you know, career-wise, if you're, if you're even thinking about data itself, like if you're not a great programmer or, or you have some knowledge, but you're not a great, you know, you're not a cybersecurity expert and you're not a, um, a great software developer, um, you still have like a wonderful career path just in data alone, right? Um, if you think about this, you know, you know, senior SQL business intelligence developer, right? This is this is um, a, a data science type position, but uh, you're basically taking data and crunching it and, and aggregating it and, and uh, using SQL to kind of figure out some answers to, to questions a company might have. Um, and you know, this job alone, the starting salary, you know, at, at the senior level is 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 considerable. This is also a few years ago. This this um, this slide, so it's even higher now, but. You know, it's it's really life changing when you think about what you're going to start at in in any job, and you and you uh, um, you know move through the the promotion process. Um, senior, don't get scared at that um, that term. Senior is three to five years in IT. So if you have you know ten years experience, that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for you to have uh, three to five years experience of practical experience to become in that uh, in that area. Uh, so, you know, there's different RDBMS systems and those systems, uh, are, you know, uh, SQL Server is, is, uh, uh, one of the top database management systems. Uh, Aurora is the, uh, AWS system, Oracle, Postgres. You have all these different, uh, database systems, proprietary systems that are installed on physical servers on actual Dell and HP and, um, <clears throat> you know, edge servers that are running, uh, the software and how, and house the databases. But these, the, the software itself is the database management system. It's how it organizes that data, right? Um, so let's do a little bit of philosophy here. Let's talk about data itself. So we have data information, knowledge, and wisdom. Um, data is that you know five 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 number up here, right? This is the raw data. If we just saw it, we wouldn't really know what it what it is. Um, once we apply some masking to data, it becomes information, something that we know what it is now, right? Um, in, in, in this case, the parentheses becomes obviously a phone number and, and dashes. We, we apply some masking to the data to kind of identify it. Um, but then we still don't know how to use it. We know what it is, but we're not going to use it. And that's knowledge. If we know how to use it, that's Joe Jones's phone number, right? Now we can start really, you know, you know, thinking about how we can use that, that uh, data that became information. We can start thinking about how to use it. Uh, to our benefit, but then when we decide whether or not to use it and how to use it, that's wisdom, right? Do I know Joe? Should I call him? Should I use this number? Should I not? Can Joe help me, right? All those different things, that basic core philosophy, that, that that's what companies want you to know, that you, you understand the value of data and why it's the new oil. Um, SQL Server is just one of many, many tools that are out there that, that allow you to manipulate data and aggregate data and um, create actionable knowledge, we'll say, off of data that the organization can take action on to benefit themselves. So quick database history. Um, data was always there in some fashion, but it's it it has a really, really robust history, right? So back in the days, unfortunately, dating myself when I started, we had something called flat file databases and they were only able to be really used on a single computer, right? Um, incredibly useful and world changing when you had a room full of people sitting in front of adding machines, you had these um, flat file databases that would just do things in seconds versus hours or days um, and give you correct answers every time, even though they were working on one workstation, it was still more valuable than um, not having them networked. Then when you had them networked, they would 
uh, different computers could use that, but they would crash a lot. So when SQL came around, um, structured query language, it was a standard language that all databases spoke. And then when RDBMS, relational database management systems came around, that was, you know, late 90s and, and uh, 2000s, that became um, the way we manage our organizations, right? That became the way we start to really have different different parts of information talk to each other and relate to each other. Orders to order details, customers to orders, um, being able to separate your data into these different kind of objects um, of like like-minded data uh, was a game changer. Like as human beings, we could actually start to think about how to really use that data. Um, but then it got too big. We started to collect too much data and the RDB, RDBMS system started to break down and the way they held those relationships together with too much data. So we went to something called, um, we didn't, we still use RDBMS constantly. It's just that when we go into data mining and data warehousing, we start to look at things like NoSQL, which is Cassandra, HBase, Mongo, CouchDB, um, then which which limits you know um eliminates some of the data size issues with speed issues and processing um eliminating the relationships and stuff like that but um whenever we needed to uh really work with large amounts of data and process things really fast we had to do distributed processing there just wasn't one computer that was fast enough to do it so we start distributing that work amongst thousands of computers and that's hadoop right the hdfs system that you kind of hear about that hadoop cluster is able to process data across you know hundreds or thousands of different PCs all processing at high high speeds to to produce those results all right and then of course we have two different two different models client server where the data is housed centrally and your workstation is doing the work just off of the data and then you have cloud-based solutions which is really what we're work, working mostly today uh we have a three-tier application uh three-tier um design where you have your data your application layer and your um presentation layer all at the same level and that's really what we're working today. So let's talk real quick about database versus our DBMS, our relational database management system. The database is the data structure. This just the the file or files that hold the data um, um, uh, in that, right? So in other words, a database is something, oh, even like a spreadsheet where you have rows and columns or the columns are the fields and the rows are the actual data. Um, that's still a database of some sort. The database management system is a different animal because it's it's the traffic cop. It it holds all your data, but it tells workstation one on the first floor, hold on one second, this workstation is processing something first, then you're a second, then you're a third. And what it did was RDBMS, what it did using SQL, structured query language, it, what it did was it said, I can ho I can host on my system, on my own you know, workstation, I could host gigabytes of data, right? And I can have thousands of people all asking me for different pieces of that data at one time, and I could still perform very efficiently. That was unheard of in flat file design databases. You could not do that. You could only have a certain amount of people attaching to the data at the same time, and then you had to lock files out. And it was it was just it was too too clumsy. It worked great, and it it, it was a world changer in, in itself, a game changer in itself. But it, it had its limitations very quickly. Um, but RDBMS um, changes all that. So uh, and the other thing is, is you know, when we talk about data, you know, raw data versus something called an IDE, right? Or, or you know, the 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 raw data itself is is in the database, it's in the RDBMS, but it's the data. Then you have these visual tools that allow you to apply your SQL queries and apply your scripts and things like that. So we have this visual world that we live in um, that we can attach to uh, all these different database uh, um, instances. An instance is when you install SQL Server once, it's the finance instance, it's the accounting instance, or it's the company one, company two, company three instance, right? <clears throat> so these um, these databases are designed that way and the tools are used to, um, to control them. So on a network, just so you're aware on a network, what we're doing is we're, we're actually taking, um, we're actually taking a server, a, a piece of equipment on our network that has an IP address and all that. And we're installing a, a SQL server instance on that machine. So it's a piece of software running it runs as a service. You'll see a service running in the background in Windows in, in the in the uh, task manager. You'll see the server database service uh, running in the background. Yeah. So and then we put that machine, that workstation, on our network, and then all the other machines on the network know that that IP address is a SQL server, and you can you can write you can write code that runs on your machine around that and points to that database server and manipulates it. Um, the data database server is the data, 
everything else that you write, Python, C Sharp, C++, SQL, Java, everything you write application-wise that runs on a machine that attaches to that data, it's just a way to manipulate the data. The data itself is really what is is, is the oil. The, the workstation program that you create is useful, but it's not the oil. The oil is the data um, on that. All right, so we're going to go into the, the demo of SQL Server. Um, and we're going to cover the management studio. Um, we're going to cover SQL. We're going to cover DML and DDL, of which is part of SQL, the two different parts of SQL. Uh, we're going to cover creating scripts so you can run scripts that will run autonomously. And then we're going to talk about managing the database, backing up and restoring, configuring security uh, on the database itself. And then um, using the SQL Server agent to actually schedule your work so that when you're working at an organization that has a SQL Server and you're the database administrator or the, or the junior database administrator, you can really use these tools to say, look, every morning at 7 a.m. I want this to happen. Every night at 11, 11 p.m. I want this to happen and so forth. So uh, the first thing I just want to kind of point out is that every single thing, we're on our training server now. So this is just so you know, it's, it is a Windows server, but it's very similar to Windows 10 or anything. So just there's no real uh, difference in what you'll see on your workstation. Okay. One of the first things I want to point out to you is um, that if you uh, download... Um, SQL Server um, Express, okay, SQL Server Express is uh, free, all right? So if you download um, SQL Server uh, on your on your workstation, uh, I'm going to say no to that, uh, and you download Express, it's free. It has all the abilities of every single thing we're going to talk about today, but really everything ability-wise at an enterprise level that you'd ever really see, and it looks exactly the same. The difference is they is they configure it so that you can't attach more than like four workstations. You can have a database more than a gigabyte, right? You'd never really run an enterprise on it, but it lets you uh, practice at an enterprise level. So it's a really great business model, I think, from um, Microsoft because they're they're getting more and more people to see how easy and how great um, SQL Server is. But on the same note, um, I just knocked my speaker over. Um, but on the same note, they are forcing larger organizations to buy the, the upgrade license so they can have more than a few stations attached at the same time. All right, so just so you know, these are um, these are things that if you choose not to learn them, that's on you because there's no cost. They run on Windows 10 um, uh, and, and that's how they do it. So, um, so that's the first thing I wanted to make sure that what you see today is, is, um, is all free it's you you can you can learn these enterprise level you know a hundred and something thousand dollar job skill sets and there's no there's not going to cost you anything right uh the other thing i'm going to point out is that when you do install it um uh, when you do install it uh these these database systems operate as services so they run um they run behind the scenes and they run uh right you see all these services running these sql service services so once the machine boots, once the server boots, SQL Server is running, it's on your network. It has an IP address. And uh, and everything you do from that point on is just manipulating that service and the data files and things like that that you're doing, right? So it's nothing magical. I'm just, I'm taking out some of that mysticism that you see <clears throat> in some of these other demos, right? When you start to be like, how does this all talk to each other? It's not <clears throat> that complicated um, other than any other piece of software that you run. Okay, um, so that being said, we're going to go to um, uh, we're going to go to SQL Server, and uh, what I usually start is I usually start something called Management Studio. So Management Studio is a piece of software that's also free and and, and you can download. So you install SQL Server Express and you install Management Studio. What I'm in now is Management Studio, which allows us to um, which allows us to basically attach to and configure and get data and run scripts and everything on any database uh, um, instance in our organization. So if I'm on the network and I have 25 SQL databases in their warehousing and operations and whatever, if I need to collect data from each one of them and, and aggregate them and sort through them, I can do that, right? And SQL allows me to do all that. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, let's, let's go through some of the basics, right? So what you're seeing is you're seeing something called ETIC training, uh, and that is a certain version of SQL Server that we're using, uh, and that particular server is an instance, right? So when you look at the services on um, on your machine, you'll see it. You'll see a SQL Server Express instance. That's one piece of of, of um, that's one instance of a server that houses data. 
The reason I bring it up is that some of the other solutions only allow one instance to run per server. So you could buy a brand new Dell server, spend $30,000 on it, and only one instance of Oracle can run on it. So if you wanted to install like three, four, five instances of SQL Server that can that manage different parts of your organization, you can do that without buying another $30,000 server. In Oracle, you really kind of have that one instance running on it. Um, so anyway, so just some of the features that you'll see changing a little bit um, from there. I'm not a Microsoft salesman, but there's there's some reasons companies go to it uh, at different levels. So underneath <clears throat> underneath the actual instance, you'll have databases. You'll have the security to the SQL Server itself. You'll have the objects, the replication, <clears throat> something called Polybase, um, high availability management, integration services, and then the SQL Server agent, which I, I told you about, will break out a little, little later on towards the end of the seminar. So each one of these folders for this particular instance, these folders and these applications apply. If I wanted to attach to another instance, I just click the attach button and, and choose whatever file server I want to uh, turn to. And in Management Studio, I would have all those different instances lined up. So in one, if picture it sitting at your desk at the office, I've got to manage three different parts of the organization. We just bought another company. You gotta, you gotta, we have to manage their SQL Server. SQL Server Management Studio allows you to sit there remotely and basically control all these data systems and make changes and adjustments and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, so under this instance, we have databases. Uh, we're going to work with the eTIC demo database today. And if you branch out the eTIC demo database, um, it's broken out its database diagrams. Um, it's broken out into um, it's broken out into tables. Uh, each one of these tables is a design that has columns and rows, right? So the columns we call fields. So the fields themselves, the columns are name and type in this case, right? We're going to be using, actually, mostly we're going to be using, uh, we're going to be using the eTIC names uh, folder, uh, a table, excuse me, eTIC names table. And in the columns of the eTIC names, we'll see things like first name, last name, and so forth. Now, what you'll notice is next to each each field, we'll see things like nvarchar, which is a variable character, 25 or 50 is, as an example, 50 characters long, um, and you'll see things like numeric and 18 comma two, we can have 18 numbers with two, with zero decimals, decimals. So we, we configure these fields in a way to capture only the type of data that we want to capture. So if we go into the eTIC names, um, if we go into the eTIC names, uh, design, right, this is where you design a new table. You give it a name, you give it, uh, you know, you give it uh, a type, right? So if I were going to put in, um, interest as one of our uh, fields, what type is that? Is it uh, numeric? Is it nvarchar? Is it, is it um, a small date and time, right? All these different formats you can choose so that the database, um, the database captures only the data that you want to capture. Now, why is that important? If you're a programmer, you'll know. If you don't have this type of control on the SQL, on the server itself and the database itself, you have to control that on the programming. What does that mean? Your program gets bigger and more complex and buggy and you have all these issues. So the more you can control on the server and the SQL server and the database side, the DBMS, the more you can control there, the less coding you have to do. And that's what companies want to see too. They want to see that you know that if I do a lot of design work on the SQL server side of things, I I have to do less work on the programming side of things, right? So the simpler the program can be, the more the faster it's going to run, the more efficient it's going to run, the, le the less uh, buggy it's going to be, and it's going to eliminate things called locking errors. So in other words, if my workstation with the program is, I don't know, 3,000 feet away, right? And it's connected by a wide area network and fiber and all kinds of if the workstation is doing that work, there's time that transmits, that tra that changes between the software on the computer making a request to get to the server, to get the data back, right? There's time that goes. If you're, if the server is doing all that work and, and inserting records, deleting records, modifying records, and the program is just telling the server to do something, then there's no time. The, the server controls everything. So the less programming you can do on the application, the better, and the more programming you can do on the SQL server side, the better, right? And that, that's how that's how that works. Um, there's a question in the chat. Let me see what that question is. Uh, do these run on Mac computers or would you need to run it in a VM? Uh, if you download SQL Server Express, you're probably going to have to run it in a VM. All right. It, it is a Microsoft specific product. Now, once you configure a database, though, like Mac, I'm sure, Apple, I'm sure, has 
tools that will allow you to um, attach that database. So the server itself probably has to run on, on, a, on a Windows machine, but you probably can get some version of, uh, um, of Studio to run uh, on a Mac. Uh, all right, so anyway, so that, that's our database, database, database design. And once that, once that table is designed, um, the data that you capture in there is gonna be very specific to that table. So this happens to be names. The fields make, make very, very, uh, uh, very sensical, right? They, 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 they make perfect common sense. So if I created a new table and that table was based on weather, I might have like a weather ID field that's gonna be a numeric uh, counter and we're going to basically make that weather, uh, that WID field. We're going to make that a unique. Uh, we're going to make that a unique uh, a counter, right? So we're going to say it's an identification. It's an identity. We're going to say yes, and we're going to make that count by ones. And we're going to start with one, and make it count by one. So every record, um, every record that we have for our weather table, uh, is going to get a unique counter, a unique index, right? We call it a primary key. So it's going to be a numeric value. It's going to say one to a trillion. And then we're going to make that our primary key. And that every time we want to do something with our database, that row is always identifiable, identifiable by its primary key. There's never a database entry, a table entry with the same primary key. That's the whole point of a primary key. It has to be unique and it has to be, it has to be unique. It has to be some way to represent that data. Then we go through when we say uh, date, you know, what, what was the date and time, you know, what was the date and time of the weather measurement, right? So we put in date and time. Then we say, um, uh, what was the temperature, right? That's going to be a numeric value. What was the humidity, right? Um, that's going to be a numeric value. Uh, what was the, um, uh, let's see, temperature dew point, right? Uh, okay, so now this is going to be, um, this is going to be um, data of kind of data, right? It's the same light likeliness. So basically you have a table called weather that only collects weather table, weather, weather data. You have a names table that collects only names data, right? It's a great way to really organize and separate your data in, into categories so that whenever you look at that table, you know you're going to see data of the same kind. But we have to have some way to link them together. Right. How many times was Bob Jones out in the rain? We don't know unless Bob Jones and the weather table are linked. Right. So that's where relationships come in. And what you do is you create a relationship between the primary key of one field and the foreign key of another. Um, and that's kind of how that works. So um, as an example, if I wanted to say something like this is the weather table, but the but the observer ID is who took that weather reading, right? So how many weather readings did Bob Jones take? Well, we would need to know the observer ID, okay? So what we do is we'll save this particular table. And now what we have, let me refresh these tables for a second here. Um, and what you'll see is we now have a weather table and we have an ETIC names table. And in the ETIC names table, if we go to design, you'll see that we have a name ID. That's that's the unique ID, the primary key of the person taking the the the, the weather, right? In this case, it's the it's the person's ID. So name ID is the is the primary key in names, um, but we have to make but we have to make observer ID. Maybe we change it from observer ID. We make that the name ID. We just just name it the same in both tables, okay? And this is going to be the foreign key um, in that table. Now. Every time that we, every time that we look at names, right? So you'll see like Ann Johnson. Ann Johnson is number four. Okay. So Ann Johnson is number four on the table. Well, in the weather table, we want to show uh, that on let's see, uh, on three fourteen twenty four. Um, uh, temperature of 45 degrees, dew point of 34 degrees, uh, so humidity 30 of uh, 75 percent, dew point of 34 degrees. That was Ann Johnson's recording, right? Um, now we can put in uh, another one here. Uh, we could put in another entry here, 40, 56, 67, 
24, and we can make that number three, right? Whoever the scientist number three is. But these relationships between the two tables are how we tell, right? How we tell, how we do that. Um, to give you an idea of how that happens, if we go to something called views, a view is a limited view of all the data and all the tables, right? So if you have 50 tables and you have terabytes of data in there, that's fine, but you don't really always want to see that. Sometimes you want to see six records, right? <laughs> Sometimes you want to see the, the, these six weather observations of, of, this, of these two scientists are what we're really looking at. So you create a view, um, which is really called a query uh, too, but in this view, if we create a view, um, and we take two tables, right? We take ETIC names in this case, and we take weather, okay? Um, what does it do? It it automatically assumes that there's a relationship between name ID and name ID, right? If it sees two numeric fields of the same name, it's an automatic assumption that there's a relationship between the two, right? So now what we do is we create a query and a query is designed Structured query language is designed to ask. It's queries a question. We, we ask the database a question. So let me show you a real quick um, example of how we would do something like that in, in this in this mode, in the visual mode. And then I'm going to talk about the language of DDL and DML as well. But if I said to you, um, I want to see name ID, first name, last name, and then I want to see the date and the um, uh, uh, temp, humidity, dew points, um, we don't need to see name ID again, but if that's what we wanted to see, uh, when we when we execute this, you'll see that the results we get, I just right clicked by the way, I just right clicked and clicked execute query. The results we get have all the results of Anne and Sarah, right? Sarah's in there because we put three in there too. Well, what we can do is we can filter, right? We can filter, we can eliminate uh, data that we don't want to see, right? So if I say I only want to see data with the person four, when I run it again, I only see Ann's data, all right? So as I work in this visual tool with SQL Server in Visual Studio, I'm sorry, in SQL Server Management Studio, it's really easy and I'm dragging and dropping and it's great, but really what I'm doing is I'm writing SQL. I'm writing structured query language, right? The visual tools are wonderful, but the design, the, the skill of writing queries is really what um, people want to know that you can do. And sometimes there's not a visual tool um, existing. Sometimes you're doing it in console mode because something else is broken. You, they want to know that you can write the SQL as well. Um, so, so, so in this example here, we're giving a great example of, of one to many, one employee to many, um, uh, uh, many weather uh, collections, right? So, if, so to show you that, if I went over here and I said um, three thirteen yesterday, they made a, um, you yeah, know, they made another one, and it was colder then. Uh, I don't even know if it was, but let's just say it was. It was um, uh, colder, and it was uh, almost snowing, and whatever it might be. Um, and say it was Anne again. Well, now <clears throat> in the weather collection table. Ann has one, two, three, a thousand entries. We can't have Ann's name in all those because that's crazy. It's a, then, we, then we're managing data that we don't have to. But when we go back to our, um, we got to our query, our view, if we, ex if we execute the query again, we have two, we have two different entries now, one on the 13th, one on the 14th, right? With the data, right? And that query stays the same, but the data results change, right? And that's what, <clears throat> that's what you want to be able to do right now. Um, one thing I'm going to kind of just uh, um, go back to is that this is the database management system. This is the data management system. You can write software in any programming language that attaches. To, we have other we have other intercessions on that. I'm not going to do that today, but you can write uh, um, C Sharp and Java and Python. They all have something called connection strings. And in connection strings, you're creating a connection strings and then you're creating an object out of that connection string and then you're working with that object. That object you can manipulate, you can change it. Um, it's called transformations. You can you can transform um, that object by adding data to it, deleting from it, whatever, all through SQL commands. So just keep in mind, there's an entire programming language section. You can write all kinds of code that runs on different machines, but but the data in this in this database is what's being changed. That's the value, that's the oil, <clears throat> what you see right now. Okay. 
So um, let's go to uh, <clears throat> okay, let's go to uh, let's take our query. Uh, <clears throat> okay, let's make a new query and Right. Let's um we're gonna write in use etic demo. That's our database. So we're telling the we're telling the system what database to use, right? Now in there, there's tables. <clears throat> and the tables revolve around um what we want to do to those tables, right? So we're gonna basically in this case, we'll just kind of um move this over because it got screwed up from the cut and paste. So here, if I want to select, there's four main um, four main terms in SQL uh, um, in a DML, data manipulation language, and those are um, select, update, delete, and insert. All right, those four commands will allow you to insert records into your table, <clears throat> delete records, um, um, list records, right. Uh, or update records, change information. So the first one we'll do is we'll just kind of run the select 200, which is the top 200 records. Um, and these are the fields that are in there. So if I execute this query, these are all the names that are in the, all the rows that are in this particular table. All right, now that's great. There's also a shortcut to doing that. If you're just asking for everything, what you do is you just select star um, from you take names. Okay, and then the reason I'm highlighting it is that when you're in this scripting mode, <clears throat> you have to highlight what you want if it's only one row, if it's only one row of, of uh, one command. That's why I'm highlighting it. If I ran this whole thing, it would run all these in a row, which is where the script comes into play. Okay, so select star and select the actual individual uh, fields. Do the same thing if you're selecting all of them and you include all of them. If you only want to select certain fields, like I only want to see the first name field, you just change your query to only select the first name. If you want to do a couple of fields, you select, you separate them by commas, and that'll give you back that, right? And then if you want to select, uh, you know, first name, first and last name from etic names, um, but you want them sorted, right? Say you want them sorted A to Z or Z to A. You can sort them by a field and then ascending or descending order. In this case, it's last name descending. So what we do is when we do last name descending, it goes from Smith to Biden. But if we change this to um, ascending, now we have Biden to Smith. All right. So, um, and you can you can index it by um, uh, by first name. Uh, actually, you can do it by very common to do is uh, last name, comma first name. Uh, in ascending order and the reason is that you know all your all your bidens will be together but it'll put it'll put the j's before the jills the jills before the sarah's the ends of it like it'll it'll do you know the fields don't have to be in order it'll still index properly but it'll it'll list all of those right so to put this into context context from a business perspective i've hired you to kind of be my data person and now i'm down like this i need to see right <laughs> <laughs> typical boss, right? You know, within the next five minutes, I need to see how many people bought product from us in this category of product when it was raining on a Tuesday between five and seven at night, um, you know, uh, when it was less than four days before Christmas and more than one day after Christmas, right? December 25th. It's really not a problem. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. Like, it sounds like, well, how am I supposed, supposed to do that? It, actually, you can. And you can use visual tools to do that. And you can use queries. You can use views. And you can write SQL queries. So um, the the idea is that is that by kind of looking at the way we're doing this here, you need to take out of a seminar like this that, wow, that's how that stuff happens. That's what That's what happens right now. What a lot of times happens, because SQL is just data related, what you do is you take all that data and you export it out in a certain format. Um, so what you can do is, let's say you create a view, um, let's say you create a view that actually uh, does that, you know, that complex query that we just talked about, right? And, and that silly boss example, right? And let's say that was demo view one. Um, well, what you could do is if you right click on demo view one, um, 
what you can do uh, is you can um, export. Uh, let me see if I can actually. Uh, okay, so it's under tasks, right? So under the database name, I apologize, they moved it. So uh, under test. Oh, this is the older version where they have it uh, in, 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 under databases. So under tasks, what you do is um, there is an uh, export data component, right? So you can actually, uh, I won't, it's too much time to go through the tool, but in the export tool, you can select the from and to and the format. So you could take the data in your queries and in your tables and in your views, you could take that data and you can export it to a spreadsheet. You can export it to some other database format. You can export from SQL to Oracle. You can export from SQL to Paradox. You can export from SQL to um, ASCII data. So you could use it somewhere else. So on top of everything else that SQL will allow you to do with data right in the tool, you can then say, look, this is limited. I can't really do high-end statistical analysis on these. I want to use IBM S SPSS, or I want to use um, Excel, or I want to run through a Python. Uh, I want to I use my Python script to look at this text file of data. That's okay. What you do is you export whatever view you created that shows that data, you export that data, and then you Python takes it over. And you know, so, so SQL also does... Um, so much in itself, but I'm saying that once you identify the real data that you're looking at, then you can export it out um, to something else. Uh, okay, so um, there's a couple of questions in the chat here. So can you have multiple databases on one server? Yes, you can. Um, uh, you can have multiple in SQL Server, you can have multiple instances of a database, of, of a SQL Server. Um, but on one SQL server, you can have um, like, like like we have an ethic demo here. Um, if we right clicked on and create a new database, we would do that. And that's the beauty of it is that you can have as many databases as you want. Um, there might be some limitation, but nothing is going to stop you. Um, and you can have, you know, um, those databases can also do queries across those databases too. Um, all right. So, and then um, the other question was, can you join data from tables uh, that belong to the data? Yes. So, uh, you can create, um, there's some limitations to that. You can't create a native query in one database that looks at data from another. But what you can do is you can you can replicate, it's called replication. Um, you'll see it, uh, bah, 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 bah. Uh, replication. So you'll see replication down here. What you can do is you can replicate data from one table to another as it's added. So as you add data into one table and one database and so forth, the replication will actually bring over all that data into one single database. Then you can query that database, right? So there's all these tools that you can use to, to do what you want to do. Um, so you don't, so just keep in mind, like, let's say you're doing like, oh, I want, I want names and I want orders and I want products. Those would not be a separate database. You'd only make a new separate database when you truly really had two physical entities that were different. If you have a company, an organization, and you have 17 different departments, there's still one database. Um, they're not they're not different because as soon as you separate databases, you're actually creating silos, which is the term we use in in database management. Once you have silos, now you have to have some middle person, middleman tool to bring that data over and merge it and replication in one case. You've seen how you can sort data and everything like that. So one thing you can do, and and we'll we'll kind of use this as an example. Let's select uh, last name, comma, first name from the table. And you'll notice we don't have a uh, uh, a Mark Brown, right? We don't we don't have a Mark Brown. So we're going to insert into etic names first name, last name, other fields, and the values are going to be, um, you know, Mark, and we're going to do Brown, okay? And now we're going to run that. Okay, one row is affected, uh, which is good. You get an error if you did it wrong. And now if we um, select and, or and sort this again, now we're going to have Mark Brown in there, okay? And um, if we want to delete, right? Uh, so there's a there's a Jill Biden in here, there's a Joseph, there's a Jay Biden. So if we come in here and we um, delete, right? Look at what it's doing. Um, it's using the where clause. Right, the where clause is what we use in SQL to say, look, I want you to do something, but I want you to do it for the whole database. I want you to do it only for, um, you know, this particular record. Uh, what we would use primarily 
in a perfect world all the time, if we had it, is the primary key. All right. When you do something to a record that's the primary key equals some value, you're guaranteed only to affect one record. If you don't use primary key, then your chances are possible that you may affect more than one record, which could be tragic. If you think about a hospital database system and you do a delete from ETIC names and you don't use a where clause, but you're the database administrator, you're the executive, you're the one who's who's got administrative privileges. That database, this database system is not doing anything to stop you. Right. So if I say, look, I'm going to delete from ETIC names where Jay's this is very specific. Now, if there were two Jay Bidens, it would delete both of them. So I would need to say something where, where primary key equals to really only only delete the one guaranteed. Um, and what happens is that when we take that out and we go back and look, right, did you see any error pop up or confirmations? And are you sure you want to delete? Are you really sure you want to delete? That's a programming thing. That's that's not like, look, you're the king of the databases. You were hired to do this. So we're not going to we're not. There's no checks and balances in this. Like you're not if you if you decide to um, do something like this. Right. If you decide to do something like this, that's it. If there's 250 million names in there that, that took 16 years to, to store, guess what? They're gone. Hmm. All right? So it's a very powerful tool. It's a very powerful position. It's also, conversely, a very dangerous position, a very responsibility-based position. Because you know at your fingertips, you have the code to basically make this database incredibly valuable to the company or destroy it in just a few keystrokes. Um, and that's the truth. Unfortunately, I speak from a lot of practical experience there. Um, there are some rollback features and things like that, but they never really work the way you think because once you delete data, there's still people adding a bunch of data in. So you, you, you can't just stop the database and stop the system from running and stop the company from doing business. So if you make a tragic error like that, rolling back to like a prior, uh, you're, you're deleting all the records that they put in since the, since you deleted the records, right? It's really, it's really hectic. Um, so the other thing here is um, what we would do here is if you is if you see the last command here is the update command. Um, and if you uh, update and we want to set, uh, like say we want to get, um, you know, say we want to set the first name equal to J where uh, the name equals Joseph and Biden, uh, we would have to make this Jill, right? Because Joseph is gone now. So if we look at Jill and Biden, right, we're going to set that name to, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to um, update that, one row is affected. And now when we, now when we um, select, you'll see that Jill became J. So, all right, there's some chats here. Let's see if we can do this. Okay. Can you, can you join it? Uh, can you apply functions to rows of data? Uh, for example, if you wanted to transform the data in some way, you can you can do things like some. So so watch. Let's let's see. Um, this will this will answer the question, but I'm going to explain the limitations, right? So let's say we just look at everything that's in here. Okay. Um, say we go to our database uh, names. We're going to design our database, and we're going to put in salary. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Already exists. Okay. Well, let's use. Let's use. Well, let's put. Let's put something in. Uh, let's put in uh, taxes, right? Um, and we'll make it a numeric uh, field. Okay. And let's say that we're going to. Um, let me just come over here and go to names, and we'll uh, do an edit. Edit is a nice way to just edit a bunch of stuff at once. So I'm going to put in. Uh, did I put tax ID? I thought I put taxes. Okay, I guess I put tax ID. All right, let's put in 23,000, 12,000, 1234, 567, 899, whatever it might be. All right, so we'll put some values in there. All right, so what we can do. Um, so let's see if we can do select count and we're going to say, um, tax ID from, uh, ETIC names. 
Okay. And if we do count, it's going to tell us how many actual records are in there that have a tax ID value. So you can actually use, to answer the question, can you modify transform data? You can do things like this to get data to show the way you want. And you can do things like sum, where you're now going to actually, you know, you're not going to actually get, uh, uh, A little bizarre. Uh, see something here. Okay. I'm just filling out the taxes field so it exists. And I'm just going to come back here and try to run this again. All right. All right. So um, not as smooth as I would have liked it, but uh, what it's doing is it's calculating, right? It's calculating the sum. Like we did a count of a number of records for certain parameters. We did a sum. We can do average, right? Um, we can do average. We can do some other basic mathematical functions. But once you do that, um, some of the other features, like if you want to get into like, you know, skewness and ketosis and other stuff and um, standard deviations or whatever. Um, you, some of them, yeah, standard deviation you could do, but um, some of them, once it, once it gets too complex, you have to export that out into um, like an Excel file or, or, or something like that, that you can do that type of math. Mostly this is about data manipulation, finding exactly data that relates to each other under certain parameters that are accessible by the fields that you've collected data for in the first place. Uh, okay, so I am not doing great on time here, but let me show you a couple of things. Um, I want to show you the concept of DML is what we've been doing. That's That's been the, the, the select and updates. I want to show you DDL uh, real quick. So let's go to, um, okay. so the best way to show you DDL is to take a table um, as an example. Let's take, um, uh, let's take boat names as an example, right? If I go to uh, script the table, um, I want to copy it to a clipboard, right? It'll take what's called DDL, data definition language. And if I create a new query, this language, it's SQL, but it's DDL, data definition language. It's the way to alter the format of databases without using the visual tools that I've been using to show you. Basically, if you want to make a, um, a boat names underscore backup table, well, Look, it's, you know, it's creating the table. It's setting the table values, right? It's all through SQL. So if you don't have a visual tool and you want to manipulate and manage a database and a table and, and within there, and there's no reason you can't do it, more complex, you have to be really, really uh, um, very, um, yeah, very, very uh, uh, skilled with, with uh, creating it from scratch. But basically... Um, there's nothing stopping you, right? So this is basically how to actually uh, create the table um, uh, boat names underscore backup that doesn't exist yet with the same format that you had the original table. And what happens is that you don't see a boat names two here, but when you actually execute this query, um, uh, I have boat names underscore backup. It's seeing something from the other table that exists already. Uh, so what we have to do is, uh, and once we do that, right, you'll see the commands are successful. And if we um, refresh those commands, you'll see that there's a boat names backup table now. And it has all the same columns and all the same keys and everything else that the table we had. So um, DDL, data definition language, is SQL except you're using it to alter existing databases, the structures. I don't want it to be Vartra. I want it to be numeric and whatever it might be, uh, or creating new tables or deleting tables. But but you can, um, DDL is the definition. Like DML is what we were using. All right, so uh, that covers that. Uh, SQL scripts, uh, what I was showing you is that uh, in, the, in the series of, um, let's see if we can do this. Uh,
So in this series of um, demands, if this were combinations of DDL and DML and just, just some really complex script that you didn't want to retype every time, uh, what you can do uh, is you can create a query, you put it all in a single query, and then what you do is you save it as um, you save it as this SQL, right? So save it as SQL 6 query SQL. And now that file, that file can just be like if we did, um, you know, script demo, right? Um, and let's say we put it into documents right there so we know where to find it. Let's say that was some really, really well thought out and tested and practiced kind of script and it saves people 20 hours, you know, of database management time, right? Totally feasible that if you're going to sit there and type things in by hand and fix things and errors, whatever, it's totally feasible. It's going to take you a long time. If you write a script for it, somebody's going to come in. Um, they're going to open up. Uh, they're going to open up the script, uh, and they're going to execute it, and it's going to just like everything that's in the script is going to run. So if you have some script that's going to go and modify databases and clear out old data and copy some data to another table as a backup and then back up the database, which I'll show you next. You can do all that in a script without actually really having to type in boom, 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 you know, and make mistakes each time. Uh, so um, on that note, just keep in mind, like every database uh, has its own maintenance features. So what you do is when you go to um, tasks, you can Detach the database, which allows you to kind of copy it and bring it with you. Um, you can take it offline, which means nobody can access it while you're doing some maintenance on it. Um, you can back it up, which means it's creating a backup file that you can restore onto any other SQL database somewhere in another building or whatever it might be, which also makes it very dangerous from a security perspective. Like once you create a backup of a database, it's sitting there as a file, that that BAK file. So if somebody gets that BAK file, they can just restore it on some system. They've got all your data. So it's really, really uh, tenuous as far as a cybersecurity perspective is that these files that that control your data, um, if you if you if you look at the actual um, details of the database and you look at the files, they're physical files. There's two of them. There's physical files. There's an MDF and an LDF. One's a log file and one is the actual data. And those two files, if anybody gets them, they have every single piece of your data. So it's a very you know. It's it's when you work in an organization, you're talking about security. It's a very um, sensitive topic to see how you how you're controlling and securing a database. Um, and with that, I will end by saying that every table, every database, I should say, uh, with tables in it, has its own security with users and roles and access of what people can do to it. And the SQL Server itself has its own security. So even if you are even if your um, Microsoft SQL Server, it, I'm sorry, even if your Microsoft Windows Server is a domain controller and controls your whole network and it's super secure, you can still have two different levels of security for a particular database that houses all your company's important information, right? So even the system administrator of the network of your organization could may, may not be able to have access to the data that his system or her system is collecting, right? So there's... When it comes to data, since it's so valuable, it's extremely sensitive topical discussions when you come up with it. To so be like, oh, just you know, just do it this way. Well, everyone's really, really super sensitive because once that data is altered, you know, if you make a mistake on DML, um, excuse me, on DDL, if you make a mistake on DDL and you just destroy one table, that is the main table for the rest of the data. Like, it's really unbelievably sensitive when discussions of data come up. So. Uh, other than SQL Server Agent, which I will show you real quick, um, that does it. So basically, uh, if you if you come down here to SQL Server Agent, um, what you see is you see uh, jobs, and then you see alerts, and you see operations, and you see proxies, and error logs, and all kinds of stuff. Basically, SQL Server Agent runs on Windows Server as a background agent and it just it just looks for what you want to do at certain times, right? So if six o'clock in the morning before the office really opens up, you want to prepare the databases for top peak efficiency for the for the eight hour workday ahead, you can run those scripts at six in the morning, right? They'll be done by the time people kind of come in. Then people work all day and then you have another 
um, another uh, efficiency script that runs at the end to clean up old junk data or whatever it is. And that runs at 7 p.m. after last people usually leave for the office, right? Uh, if you have a security feature where you want to stop the SQL server and then do a download for a patch and then start the server again, like like whatever you're doing for your system as you're managing it and you're 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 addressing things to manage it at peak performance. Whenever you have something like, wow, I kind of shouldn't have to go click, click, click to do this, most likely um, SQL Server agent can do that for you. All right. Okay. And with that, I'm going to answer a few more questions that are in the list here. Uh, does, does the capitalization map? Capitalization does not matter um, in SQL Server. It might matter with some of the others, but not in SQL Server. Someone is leaving, which is fine. Uh, may there, maybe there are no values. in the Oh, yeah. Someone's helping me with the taxes. So I appreciate the help. We figured it out. Um, where do people in the company normally put scripts so everyone can access them? Uh, so the scripts themselves are actually a little more sensitive than you think because the scripts themselves tell somebody somewhere everything about your data. It tells them what the indexes are, it tells them what the field names, the field sizes are. It tells them a lot about your data. So they're not really kept anywhere where everybody can get them and use them. That's not something that um, usually happens. Um, the other thing is that since those scripts can be damaging, right? They could, if they run at the wrong time, they could screw the database up versus run, maybe they have to be run when the system is down, you know, or, you know, where, where no connections are made or something. So you generally, you do not keep SQL scripts out there uh, just for people to kind of download and run at will. That's not usually, they're usually secured almost at the same level the database is secured. Um, and then what you do is you give only certain users on the SQL server, only certain users have access to run scripts, right? To, to, to manipulate the data. So, um, so that, that way they, you know, they may have read access so they can attach the database and see data, but as soon as they try to make data changes in DDL or DML, the security system is, is stopping them from doing that. So if anybody has any other questions, I'll answer them. Otherwise, uh, I, I, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot and saw a lot, and maybe this opens up your eyes a little bit to, to another career path that you didn't know about before, All right? Uh, I see two questions. Thank you, and thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, pleasure having you all here. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day.